Okay, we're recording now. So, like always, no talking about the preaching. <laughs> I'll pick up at verse 3. Why do we fast and you don't see? Why afflict ourselves and you don't notice? Yet on your first day, fast day, you do whatever you want and oppress all your workers. You quarrel and brawl and then you fast. You hit each other violently with your fist. You shouldn't fast as you are doing today. If you want to make your voice heard on high, is this the kind of fast I choose? A day of self-affliction, of bending one's head like a reed, and lying down in mourning clothe, clothing and ashes? Is this what you call a fast, <clears throat> a day acceptable to the Lord? <clears throat> On the next page is, continues with verse 6. Isn't this the fast I choose? releasing wicked restraints, untying the ropes of a yoke, setting free the mistreated, and breaking every yoke? Is it, sh it sharing your bread with the hungry and bringing the homeless poor into your house, covering the naked when you see them, and not hiding from your own family? Then your light will break out like the dawn, and you will be healed quickly. Your own righteousness will walk before you, and the Lord's glory will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and God will say, I'm here. If you remove the yoke from among you, the finger pointing, the wicked speech, if you open your heart to the hungry and provide abundantly for those who are afflicted, your light will shine in the darkness and your gloom will be like the moon. The Lord will guide you continually and provide for you, even in parched places. He will rescue your bones. You will be like a watered garden, like a spring of water that won't run dry. Whew. That's the end. <laughs> what do you think you were in, in general from a high level? What are we saying here? What, what is Isaiah 58 telling us? What's he saying about, what are we saying? What is God saying about fasting? If you, if you, uh, or I guess he's really um, talking about any type of religious, religious ceremony or you think he's basically saying um, fasting or it's kind of, uh, it's kind of um, in line with what we've been talking about the last couple of weeks. It, it, if you fast, what else do you have to do or what should you not do as you fast? Should you fast? I think, Go ahead. I think it means when you're, when we're talking about fasting, we're thinking like, okay, we're going to give up some chocolates or something right. like that. And I, I don't think that's what he meant as fasting. We should be looking after others and caring for others, helping, helping them. And I mean, you know, I guess we should invite strength strangers into your house things are not like they used to be I mean you can't invite strangers you can't invite some people you know sometimes and and right. something not happen <laughs> <laughs> right yeah it sounds like he's saying that uh, just uh, also I think there's, I think you're right on but fasting alone is not enough you have to do those things that like you just mentioned now uh -oh do things for others. I mean, like, I think when we send, send people need help, and like when the church says, okay, we need to help this family that's in the community, and we do that, I think that's sort of fasting all the time. I mean, right. Because we do help. We might could have, might could help more. Some of us might could help more than others, but I think that's what it, what it really is supposed to do. Right. I think you're I think you're right on right on with that. I was thinking that it might, it's also meaning not necessarily just giving items and food, but it's also giving up the things that tie you down, like your negative emotions. Oh, that's a good point. Right. Good point. Yeah. I think he's saying don't go through the motions. Right. That's also true. Yeah, don't go through the motions just just um, be ever mindful of why you're doing that. It's not about the fasting. It's about what you should be um, really doing, what y'all have said. What you sh That's the focus. It's not really the fasting. 
Right, right. It's not about just being hungry, right? <laughs> Making yourself right. hungry. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. The next um, part of the uh, top of page 119, he's just talking about how hard it is. The writers talk about how hard it is sometimes to know who's talking uh, when we read about prophets because um, the sentences are often in first person. Sometimes the speaker is God, and sometimes he's talking to someone. So, and, and how confusing it is. <clears throat> so, I'm going to skip down to the to the bottom here. Don't or near the bottom. Don't worry if it's confusing. We can still discern what God is saying in this passage. God is pointing out the folly of superficial religious practice, and then explaining what true religion looks like. Does that sound familiar? Well, it should, because the prof prophetic books of the Bible often include calls for authentic, true worship of God. Sometimes it's around what kind of sacrifice would be pleasing to God. Sometimes God calls people in the, on the carpet for what kind of Sabbath keeping they've been doing. <clears throat> and today we're talking about fasting. We can see that God was upset that the house of Jacob I'm going to turn the page if I can get my fingers on it. Um, for he was getting on the house of Jacob for fasting for the wrong reasons. And you know, God chose a certain kind of fast. <clears throat> so what is the problem with fasting? Because God, God had not prohibited fasting. He specifically commanded at least one uh, fast in the law. It was the, a fast associated with the Day of Atonement. And, that, and that's in Leviticus. But there were plenty of other precedents in the Old Testament for fasting, usually the result of a command of a ruler or a king. The uh, I'm gonna call I'm gonna try to say this: the Jebusites, <laughs> friends of Saul, was that right? For yeah. go ahead. That's right. Yeah, he fasted for they fasted for seven days when Saul died. <clears throat> David fasted when his child with Bathsheba was fighting for his life. And then a scholar, Bo Lim, who well, I've never heard of this fellow, points out in another example that Zechariah in Zechariah indicates that Israel fasted on the fifth and seventh months for 70 years following this, the destruction for Jerusalem. Does that mean they fasted the whole month for twice a year? The fifth and seventh month, fifth and seventh months, that's what it that's what it insinuates. So for 70 years, Israel would fast at least twice a year, commemorating the fact <clears throat> that they had lost their home and their king. They fasted and prayed, seeking a response, an answer to their troubles. So the book asks now, have you ever had an experience with religious fasting? If so, what does it mean to you? If not, you can, can you see yourself trying it? Well, we established last week that Nell is not going to give up chocolate but outside of that, <laughs> have, have, has anyone ever fasted? Any folks ever fasted? And do you, or do you ever see yourself as fasting? Personally, it's never entered my mind to fast. <laughs> it has entered my mind, but I've never been uh, strong enough to do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the will to not do it uh, has always been stronger, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. I can't even give up a particular food. Sometimes I'll go without uh, eating uh, sweets for a little while, and it seems like the longer you you go without it, the easier it is, the easier it gets, and I guess because the sugar is getting out of the system, but there's always that weak point. It might be three days later, it might be a week later, where <clears throat> I go right back to, to doing it. I do know someone that did fast, and my thoughts were that he should not be fasting. He was Muslim, and he was very, quite religious, and he would fast. He was also diabetic. And I saw situations where he, it was evident that some of that was, get, was causing harm to himself. Right, I can, I can see that, yeah. <clears throat> okay, the next section is the fast that God doesn't choose. 
The problem in today's passage is that the fasting rituals had taken on the form of religion without prayer. That's pretty profound, the form of religion without prayer. <clears throat> to borrow a phrase from John Wesley, uh, the people believe that God would listen to them if they would go through the motions. We just heard it when you guys say that earlier. They thought they could earn God's favor by fasting. So they started afflicting themselves, bending their heads like reeds and lying down in mourning, clothing in ashes. These acts were probably some kind of prescribed ritual. Well, what they should have been doing, God said, was stop oppressing workers and start caring for the vulnerable. He's picking up with where, where you, what you were saying earlier now. <clears throat> That's the kind of fast God chose. So Isaiah heard God say, shout loudly, don't hold back, raise your voice like a trumpet. That's exactly what the prophet did. For God was not impressed with their self-affliction, head bending, mourning, mourning clothing, and ashes. God was incredulous that they would desire knowledge of my ways like a nation that acted righteously and that didn't abandon their God. <clears throat> now here's what, he, what God would rather they do. God would rather the people set free the mistreated, share bread with the hungry, provide shelter for the poor, and clothe the naked. In other words, uh, don't go to uh, Cancun when your state is a nice storm. <laughs> I, I had to throw that in. Note that there are nearly the same kind of causes for worry that Jesus speaks about in Matthew. <clears throat> They are similar to the needs of the vulnerable in, Ma in Matthew. Jesus said that what we do for them, we do for him. But what we don't do for them, we don't do for him. <clears throat> Does that sound familiar? Yeah. Yeah, I think we either read that last week or the week before. I, I can't remember. Right. Yeah. In similar ways, Paul reminds us that the church is overly, overly, that overly rigorous self-discipline, too much attention to human commandments look wise, but they are no help against indulging the selfish immoral behavior. Isaiah heard God saying those that should have fast out of their abundance so that those who have not will, let me, let me start that over. Isaiah heard God saying that those who have, have should fast out of their abundance so that those who have not will not live in scarcity. <clears throat> So the writer, he, he spends the next couple of paragraphs uh, driving home the point. <clears throat> the people desired God, but they went about it in the wrong way. They fasted to earn God's attention, but at the same time, they were mistreating one another. <clears throat> so I'm going to skip down. Uh, that's another quote from Bo Lim. But if we go down to the next paragraph, it was not enough <clears throat> that God's people would do good works. They also needed to stop several destructive practices. On the very day they were fasting, they were oppressing their workers, brawling and brawling, and hitting violently. Maybe that was because they were hungry. Maybe that's why they were fighting. God judged their sincerity by how they treated others, not by the precision of their religious procedures. Instead of just fasting from foods, they should have they should fast from certain destructive economic practices. And then John Calvin chimes in. Not only do many people fast in order to atone for their cheating and robberies and to plunder more freely, but even that, during the time of the fast, they may have greater leisure for examining their accounts, pursuing documents, and calculating us usury and contriving methods by which they may lay hold on the property of their debtors. <laughs> so uh, uh, it sounds like that uh, one of the points here is that some people pass, uh, fast to be forgiven for their sins. It's kind of, kind of what I'm reading in, into this. <clears throat> we, might be we might be reminded of the story of the siege of Jerusalem by the Chaldeans in Jeremiah. Uh, these were slaves who were set free, every, were to be set free every three years. Uh, but as soon as the Chaldean, Chaldeans left, the masters tracked them, the freed men and the women, and enslaved them again. 
awful things happened in those days. Sometimes people got their got into it in their heads that the Old Testament is all about proper rituals, and that the New Testament is where God finally does away with the old rules and procedures. But today's passage is one that shows us that God has always been more interested in the sincere, heartfelt religion than in empty rituals, empty rituals. <clears throat> God has long judged our worship by how we treat others. Also note that God did not tell them not to fast or not to go through their formal religious ceremonies. We should assume that God does not like formal rituals in worship. Nowhere is that in our text? Nowhere is that in our text. In fact, God established many rituals in the Bible. What God objected to was how their formal religion didn't make a difference in their behavior and how they assumed it would curry them favor with God. And God does not prohibit rituals in worship, <clears throat> but those rituals should be a way for grace to flow out of the worshipers and into the world, especially through the vulnerable. That should be the purpose of their fasting. What do you consider to be the true purpose of your fasting? Now we haven't, uh, we, we, none of us uh, uh, admitted to, uh, we all admitted that we've never really fasted in what we, figured, we we consider the true sense of the word. But we do do good things, which I think is included in, the, in fasting in, in this text. So what do you consider to be the true purpose of, of your good deeds, of doing, doing for others? I think we read, uh, it, it was once in the past couple of weeks about some people doing good deeds just to be recognized for them. And we all agreed that that really wasn't the true purpose. Yeah, it wasn't that a story that Jesus told about the Pharisees um, giving their money making a big show of it. Um, and I mean, he stressed, you know, you do it for the lady who gave her, her all versus the Pharisees who did it for show. Right. Right. It even, um, uh, the passage we read before a couple of weeks ago even mentioned that some, <laughs> some preachers even do it for show just to be, uh, um, uh, to get next to people who have political power and economic power. <clears throat> yeah, I think of when you, th when you were talking about that, I'm reminded of my parents before they had us, my, my sister and I, they would go and um, my mom was a school teacher. My father worked at the hospital and they would find out about kids who didn't have much through my mom or whatever and on Christmas they would go like they went up and put a basketball goal up and um, um, and stuff like put basketball goal up for a kid who would never get it and and do it anonymously and, and stuff my father always was doing stuff like that you know where I don't several things I didn't learn about until after he was dead and gone before I, I find out what he did. He just didn't want to have, I mean, he just did it or he got people to help him do it, but it, it wasn't because he wanted any recognition for it. He just felt the need to do it. And right. So, right. That's the, the, the true purpose. Any, anyone else? Okay. Here, the next section talks about the fast that, that God chooses. <clears throat> um, maybe you fasted regularly, regularly. Maybe you fast occasionally in response to a need. Maybe you've never fasted. But we've all encountered someone in our lives who've carried out some religious practices for the wrong reasons. For, exa for example, some people go to worship not as a spiritual discipline, but to be seen or well influence in the church organization. Another example could be reading the Bible, not for edification, but for ammunition to use against one's enemies. Have you ever known anyone to do that? <laughs> I don't know if I've known anybody uh, personally that's done that. <clears throat> Imagine a Christian business owner who pays 
her employees less than a livable wage. Or there might be a person who prays for another person, not out of love, but out of spite. How does that work? How do you pray for somebody out of spite? I don't, I don't, I don't understand that either. I didn't have an, couldn't think of an example. Such notions are unpleasant for us to consider. So imagine how they make God feel. When God corrected the house of Jacob, God included a threat that unless they followed God's ways, disaster would befall them. But this time they were given a promise that if they would follow God's ways, blessings would come to them. Sometime God uses a stick. Sometime God uses a carrot. God wanted so much better for the house of Jacob. We see it in a series of if-then statements in Isaiah. If they would stop finger pointing, speaking wickedly, and open their hearts to the afflicted, then their light would shine in darkness. <clears throat> And the passage doesn't really use if and then. He's kind of putting those in because when I read this, I thought, I don't remember remember it, seeing if then. <laughs> no, I figured out what he, was, what he was doing here. God wanted their light to break out like the dawn and their own righteousness to walk before them so that they would be healed quickly and have the Lord's glory as their rear guard. With God ahead of them and behind them, no one would be lost. All the people would move ahead into God's future, including those who are economically at risk. What a beautiful sight. <clears throat> the image of divine light comes back again later. Your light will shine in the darkness and your gloom will be like the noon. This theme of light culminates in Isaiah uh, chapter 60, when the nation will arise, shine, because the light had come. Nations will come to your light and kings to your dawning radiance. Uh, for the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. But for now, it's our task to work for justice, not to cover our sins in public displays of piousness. This was evident to the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1908 when they adopted the social creed. And this is back during the times where there were few laws to protect workers, including child laborers. The social creed called for an end to child labor, a fair wage, and, a, and safety standards for workers. Workers also deserved a right to things such as arbitration, at least one day off, at least one day off each week, and a reasonable length to the work day. If I just had one day off per week, I'd still be in, and and I still have a bad attitude. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> On this first Sunday of Lent, let us choose the kind of God, fast God chooses. Let our fast take a form that pleases God. God will answer when we call and we'll say, I'm here. In what ways could you fast the way God chooses in this Lent? Now, uh, go ahead, man. Somebody that's in need, I do try to to help them, or if it's something I can do for them. Right. We don't probably don't do as much right now with this pandemic going on because we're not getting out, we're not seeing, you know. And I do try to give to some of these things that but, that you get, but so you get so many and you, you can only help so many people one you know each family can right you right. sort of have i get a lot from out of the county for helping the hungry people in the other counties and i think i don't think they should be allowed to do that because each county needs to help their own county i don't need to be sending money for feet to feed people in Mecklenburg when we got people in Stanley that need the money to be. I mean, right. that's, that's the way I look at things. That's uh, <clears throat> one good thing about um, where, where, I work, where, where I work, we have an opportunity to, to give to different, different charities. And one of them is the United Way. And you can specify where. What, you know, the United Way of Stanley County, for example, is what I, what I give to. So th I think that's good. Even though the place that I work is in Mecklenburg, <laughs> I actually work for, uh, well, here in the past year, I've been working out of my basement. But <laughs> uh, when I go in, it's, it's in, in Charlotte. 
Okay. Now, um, I see a box on the screen that says Jay Newsom, but I can't see your face. Oh. <laughs> and I'm glad you're here, but I can't place who you are. Oh, I, um, okay. Hold on. Let's see. There. Oh, yeah. That's <laughs> who you are. <laughs> yeah, you have um, uh, uh, a son and a daughter, and I think they go to Greystone. Yes, they do. Yes. Yeah, yeah they do. Yeah. Um, Who's that? <laughs> <laughs> you knew around here, aren't you? <laughs> well, yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you showed your, your your picture. Now I know exactly who you are. Um, my kids went to uh, Greystone as well. My daughter's uh, last year was her last year was her last year. She, she's oh, okay. out. Now. My son's been out for uh, three or four years. Yeah. 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 I, I've been trying to get up. And, and do this, but Sundays, I take the day of rest seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I think my computer takes the day of rest seriously because he, he didn't want to wake up this morning. <laughs> I have, um, I usually leave it on, but uh, Saturday night I do the virus scan and the virus scan turns it off. So I have to turn it back on on Sunday morning. Maybe I should change that day to Friday night and turn it back on. On, on Saturday morning, but uh, the, I had to turn it off just because it gives me confidence that it ran, <laughs> that the virus protector ran. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any any more thoughts? Uh, if if not, I'll read the closing closing prayer. Okay. Well, I'm going to read the, the prayer on page 126. As we begin this season in of preparation of your passion, Lord Jesus. Call us to se call us to self examination. Where have we chosen the wrong fast? What kind of fast have you chosen for us? Make us faithful, Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, everybody have a good week. Uh, Neil and Frank, have you had your shot yet? Or you got an appointment? Pardon? Or do you have an appointment for your vaccination? We got, uh, we, it. we got our first one. We're supposed to go back the 22nd of March and get the second one. Okay. Well, good. So you're, you're halfway protected right now. Well, <laughs> even bet well, even better than that, actually. But uh, but yeah. uh, it's largely protected. But but do go back and get the second one. Yeah, uh, that's one thing we should have lifted up earlier is the the falling uh, hospital rates in. Uh, it, it, Hopefully we're in the, moving in the right direction. I'm going to stay moving in the right direction now. Mm. Frank did good with his, but I had a little bit of trouble with mine. I, I got the shakes, and I had a lot. Of my arm, in fact, I was sore all over, but my arm is really sore and really red. But it's okay now. Uh, Tony's mom had what, trouble with the second one, but they said the second one's worse, and then I don't particularly. Well, you get the second one. <laughs> well, I'll, 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 I'll get my second one this afternoon, and I'll let I'll give a report next Sunday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, my dad, my dad, and uh, Tanya's dad didn't have any trouble with either one of the shots, but her mom uh, had got weak from the second one. Well, Frank kept saying it's going to take me to go to the hospital. I said, no, you're not either. I'm going over there. Yeah, because she scared me. I tell you, she was shaking all over. Couldn't hardly uh, walk. I didn't know what was I was coming just, off. I was just like this. And I just, I couldn't stop. I just was shaking all over. Oh. How long did that I got, last? I got a little bit nauseated, and then I was weak for about a couple of days. Yeah. Couldn't hardly go. But other than that, I didn't have any any fever or anything. And his arm didn't get sore. Yeah. You, you're talking about not wanting to go to the hospital. You know, back in the summer, my dad fell off a ladder. <laughs> so I, um, and the ambulance took him to Duke because he lives in Alamance County. And so I left here and I drove to Durham. And of course, he was still in the emergency room. And they finally got us out of the hallway and put us in a, in a room. And every so often, this is back in, uh, right after the 4th of July. And while I was in there waiting, waiting for the, you know, for him to do something with him, every so often I'd hear a nurse walking through the hallway going, we got another one. 
we got another one, and she they, every time she said that she was uh, confirming a COVID test. <laughs> so I was I was sitting in that room, I was scared to death, you know, because you know I, you know we were all surrounded with people that that, that had it, but uh, they get, they did a good job keeping us separated. Okay. Okay. Well, guys, uh, have a good week, and uh, next next Sunday I'll, I'll uh, make sure I try to log on sooner so I'm not late <laughs> if I have any trouble. Well, good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, everyone, yeah. everyone have a blessed week. Okay, everybody have a good week. Yeah, have See a good you later. Bye-bye.